All right, if you would, open up with me in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke, as uh, today we are starting a new journey. Uh, We're beginning at Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and we are going to be going through the entire Gospel of Luke in the coming days, months, and possibly even years. Uh, As we look at the Gospel, I'm so thankful for the the messages that Kevin preached over the last couple weeks. They were challenging uh, to me. I'm sure they were to you as well. And as as we think about uh, just where we're at as a church, I think it's a timely moment for us to begin going through the Gospel of Luke. And and it's so interesting. Of course, the, the word Gospel simply means good news news. As you know, there are four different gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of those gospels tells the story of Jesus, tells the good news from a different perspective. And what I love about the gospel of Luke, and you're going to see this as we go through, is that Luke is known for seeing the people that many other people do not see. He's known for for looking and noticing people that that in many ways should have been forgotten. And that's going to play itself out into our story this morning as we look at the beginning of Luke. But if you're here today and and you feel maybe like like somehow you are glossed over or maybe like your life doesn't matter or maybe like, uh, you know, God is is maybe using other people but not you, I hope you lean in not just to this message but to the gospel of Luke as a whole. God wants you to know and he wants me to know that his love reaches to every one of us. He has a purpose for every one of us. Even if you feel long forgotten, God has a plan for you. We're going to see that in the story this morning. Uh, But before we do that, I want to kind of frame what we're about to look at in the Gospel of Luke around this idea of preparation, of preparation. The Gospel of Luke doesn't, strangely enough, begin with Jesus, right? I mean, it's a gospel about the good news of Jesus, but it doesn't like start in at Bethlehem. That comes in Luke chapter 2, but there's an entire chapter of preparation before we hit Jesus coming to the earth. Now, uh, there are principles when it comes to preparation that are incredibly important, and Many of you know this because you are hunters, okay? I will tell you up front, I am not a hunter. I've never been hunting. I've kind of made the decision. Kyle Link asked me, uh, you know, he said, if you'd ever want to go, you can come with me. And if I ever go hunting, I'm going to go with Kyle because he's already got like six deer this season and he's out there for more. So it's like, man, if you want to kill a deer, go with Kyle. Um, You ask how that's possible. Multiple counties, tags in multiple counties. Okay. Nothing illegal going on there as far as I'm aware of. All right. Uh, But but when it comes to preparation, here's the thing. There are a couple of days left, I'm told, in deer season, right? Imagine that I have like the Holy Spirit come over me and say, I want to go deer hunting. I want to kill a deer this season. There'd be a problem, right? Uh, One of my problems is I don't have anywhere to go. Another problem is I don't have a gun to use. Another problem is I don't have camo. The biggest problem is I have no skill. So if I decided right now that I wanted to go deer hunting, I couldn't do it because I'm unprepared. Have you ever been unprepared for something in life? Maybe an opportunity arises and and you're caught flat-footed. Maybe you hesitate for a moment and and you just recognize your lack of preparation cost you the opportunity. Well, for the past two weeks, and if you didn't hear these messages, I really encourage you, go to our YouTube page. You can find these two messages. For the last two weeks, we've been thinking about the opportunities, the doors that God would open for us both individually and, and as a church. And I'm so excited for what God is doing. It was so convicting. But when we think about those doors opening, there's a step before you go through the door. There's a step of preparation that must take place so that when that door opens, you are ready to go through it. And that principle is just a truth in life that if you are not prepared for the opportunities that God gives you, you will miss out. So how do we take the steps of preparation? If God is doing something in your life, if God is doing something in my life, if he wants to do more and deeper and beyond what we've yet experienced, if that is true, how do we prepare for the door that God wants to open, both individually and as a church? Well, that's what I believe Luke speaks to this morning as we dive in together. Now, we're going to start in Luke chapter 1 in verse 1, okay? And the first four verses of Luke are kind of like a a prologue. They're kind of like a preamble where Luke is telling us what he is doing and how he's doing it. So I want us to look at these uh, as as we begin. It says this, many have undertaken, this is Luke writing, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Now, pause right there. There are several things uh, we need to kind of uh, draw out of this. The first is Luke is obviously not the first to write. 
I mean, he says, many have undertaken to compile a narrative. In other words, other people have written down gospels. Luke may have been the last gospel or maybe the second to last gospel that was written. He says, other people have already done this. They've written a narrative to compile events. But he says this, it's very interesting, that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, Luke is keying us in. It's not something that I'm going to give you, or it's not something that others have given you, a random kind of set of events. He's saying these are special events. They are fulfilled, speaking back to the fulfillment of the Old Testament that God has been preparing literally for thousands of years, the events that Luke is about to write down for us. He's saying this is something special. This is something unique. This is something that goes back all the way to God's plan for redemption from the beginning. And he says, I want you to know about these events that have been fulfilled. And then he says, this in verse 2, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So, So get this, Luke is not himself an eyewitness of Jesus. And it's very interesting because it's almost like that made Luke even more curious to talk to those people who had actually seen him. Now, there were many people who had seen Jesus, and here's what Luke did. He said, okay, I'm going to go around to these people, and I want to hear their stories. I want to compile their stories. People who saw Jesus, people who heard Jesus, people who touched Jesus. Why? Because Luke was a person like us who loved Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus, but he didn't have the chance to see him. And aren't we glad that Luke was so curious? He got these stories firsthand from the people who saw them, and then he says this in verse 3, it also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus. Now pause right there. Who is Theophilus, right? I mean, that's a very interesting name. Theophilus literally means lover of God. It's very possible that this was a wealthy individual in the early church who, who kind of said to Luke, Luke, I know you kind of have compiled these stories. I know you're very interested. Luke, I'm going to bankroll you. And why don't you just take some time to do this for a, for a living, do it and write it down and give it to me. It's possible that the book of Luke was a commissioned work to give to an individual. It's also possible that Theophilus is just another name for the church, for those who love God, and that Luke knew we would want and need to keep these stories. And of course, we believe that God inspired Luke to write this work, but notice what Luke says of his own work. He says, I carefully investigated everything from the very first in order to write an orderly sequence. In other words, Luke is saying, listen, I'm not talking about rumors. I'm not talking about, you know, grandpa stories where the fish was a foot and then it was a foot and a half and then all of a sudden it was really kind of second in the record books of the whole state. No, he's not not talking about that. I carefully investigated everything. And here's what you're gonna notice. As we go through the book of Luke, you're going to see a lot of names, you're going to see a lot of places, you're going to see a lot of titles, you're going to see a lot of, you know, time sequence, you're going to see a lot of detail. Because Luke was, you know, it seems to me Luke was kind of anal about these things. You ever meet someone like that? Like someone who's just like anal for detail? You know, it's not that, you know, three isn't close enough, it's 3.14. And then it's, it's not just 3.14, it's really 3.1415. And then 3.14159. And there are some people who's just like, their mind works that way. They want to know the details. They want to work, that's pi, by the way, it's math. You know, you can talk to a math teacher about that, okay? Um, you can talk to someone who's like anal. They want to know all of the details. That was Luke. And he said, I investigated it from the very beginning and I wrote it down in an orderly sequence and he gives us the reason, he gives us the reason he did it in the next verse he says, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Luke isn't asking us to take a leap of blind faith. He's saying, no, I looked at the, into this. I carefully investigated it. I gave you detail after detail after detail after detail to prove to you that these things really happened and they were accurately recorded. And we are so thankful or ought to be thankful that God in his grace inspired Luke to give us this amazing book, this amazing story, this amazing history of when Jesus walked the earth as a man just like you and me. And so we begin the story that Luke gives us. And he starts in the next verse by saying, in the days of, notice it, King Herod of Judea, there was a priest of Abijah's division named Zechariah. In other words, detail after detail after detail. In fact, here's what I want to encourage you to do. As we go through this study, I would encourage you to go through and just underline. Anytime there's a historical detail, anytime there's something that just affirms, hey, this isn't, this isn't you know, once upon a time. It's in the days of King Herod of Judea. There was a priest of Abijah's division. His wife was from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Here are the details. Here's the information. But he's also introducing us to a couple of different people, Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
Now, as we're going to find out, Zechariah and Elizabeth, even at this time, were already very old. They were already advanced in their days. We don't know exactly how old, uh, but they were beyond the normal childbearing years. Now, it's so interesting because Zechariah and Elizabeth are kind of a counterpart to a couple that has a similar description in the Old Testament. And by that, I mean Abraham and Sarah, a couple who was also old, but they were faithful and God chose to bless them in a unique way. Here's what it says of Elizabeth and Zechariah. It says, both were righteous in God's sight, living without blame according to all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. So have you ever met like an older couple that kind of you just seems perfect? Um, you know, I think of, uh, in this church, I think of John and Linda versus Sheldon. Uh, many of you may know them, many of you may not, but it's just like, I love John and Linda. I have never had an interaction with John and Linda where I'm not like, these people are salt of the earth. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing people. That was kind of like Zachariah and Elizabeth. I mean, they're older people. He's a priest, so he's kind of like a professional minister, but they're very kind. It says beyond even that, they followed the way of God. And this is important because like our day, in their day, there was a lot uh, uh, on the line in terms of religious pretension. In other words, you could be a Jewish person who pretended to be faithful. You could be a Jewish person who pretended to follow the Lord. But it says of Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were true. There was no pretense. They were humble. They followed all of the commands and the requirements of God. They weren't flashy. They didn't wear it on their sleeve. They were just good people who followed after God and trusted him. But it says in the next verse, they had no children because Elizabeth could not conceive and both of them were well along in years. Now, here's what you need to know. When it comes to their idea of conceiving, They didn't see uh, the problem of conception as a a physical problem or a physiological problem. In other words, no one would have looked at Elizabeth and said, oh, you have a medical issue. They would have looked at Elizabeth and said, you have a spiritual issue. And here's why. Because they believed God has the power over the womb, right? God has the power to open it and close it. And therefore, most people would have looked at Elizabeth and said, you know what? You you seem nice and you seem righteous and and we, we get that. You're kind of salt of the earth. But something may be wrong. In fact, Elizabeth would have lived really her entire, child, child, her entire childbearing years in great shame that she could not produce a child. And so it tells us up front, they're both along in years, there was no child, and it says because Elizabeth couldn't conceive. She would have worn that on her sleeve and people would have seen her as the person where the line ended. Now, keep that in your mind because that's going to become important as we come to the end of this story. But now the scene is going to shift. We know a little bit about Zechariah and Elizabeth. And it says this, when his division, so now it's talking about Zechariah. When his division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, it happened that he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. So pause right here. When it came to the priestly divisions, there were many priestly divisions. The division of Abijah was one among many. And so here's what would happen. When your division kind of came up in the calendar, you would go along with all the priests from your family if you're in the Levitical priesthood, right? You would go with your family and you would go to a period of about two weeks at the temple where you and your family would perform the priestly rituals. So it was kind of like you'd go two weeks out of the year, then you'd go home and you'd you'd kind of live your life, okay? So this was the time when Zechariah would go and it says at that moment there was a custom of choosing one of those priests by lot to go and burn the incense in the sanctuary of the Lord. So, So think of it like this. There were probably hundreds of priests in the division of Abijah, but one priest in particular, Zechariah, was chosen by lot, Now, of course, there's going to be a whole lot of coincidences as we go through the Gospel of Luke and really as you read the Bible that so-and-so happened to be chosen. We know that this isn't just, you know, they rolled the dice and he was chosen. This is something that God was orchestrating. He was chosen by Lot for a reason. And now, this is kind of a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, right? Not everybody got to do this. Now, it was Zachariah's turn to go into the temple and to offer incense before God. Now, pause right there because if you're Zachariah, right, you're You're an old man, right? You've probably never got to do this before. Your number is called. You're going to be a little bit nervous. 
I mean, there are stories, right, about priests who go into the temple and who kind of mess it up and get it wrong, and it doesn't end well for them. You can read some in the Old Testament. It doesn't work out well for a priest who messed this up. So if you're, if you're Zechariah, you're probably a little bit nervous. You're probably like, I, I want to go do this well. And it says this, at the hour of incense, the whole assembly of the people was praying outside. So not only are you nervous because this is your once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but you know all of these people are praying outside. They're waiting for you. You go in and you just want to do your job well, you want to do it with a worshipful attitude, and you want to get out. But here's what happens. It says that as he goes in, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah wasn't expecting this. And uh, by the way, whenever an angel shows up in scripture, crazy things happen. I mean, think burning bushes, right? Think, you know, commander of the army of the Lord telling Joshua, you know, I'm neither for you or against you. I mean, there's all kinds of just nutso things that happens when angels show up. So this is like a precursor that something different is happening. And it says this, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear. Now, isn't it interesting? That's actually the most common reaction when someone interacts with an angel, and we don't know, was, was Gabriel here? We're going to find out it's Gabriel in a minute. Was he shining with glory? You know, was he appearing as a man? Was it just like Zacharias? You know, we don't know what Gabriel looked like. We don't. But we know that Zacharias, Zacharias saw him and he was terrified. And I do think it's interesting that sometimes whenever God sends us a message or he sends us a messenger, sometimes our first interaction or sometimes our first reaction rather is fear. You know, when, when Kevin had the door out here and he was, he was kind of saying, whenever God opens the door, we've got to run through it. You know, and, and honestly, I was kind of worried when Kevin banged through the door, I was like, this whole thing is just going to collapse. Did anyone else think that? Okay, go back and watch the sermon. If you didn't see it, you'll know what I'm talking about, okay? But it's like, you know, he also talked about, Kevin did, uh, those who, you know, when God opens the door, there are people who kind of, you know, peek through and kind of look both ways and maybe put their toe in and dabble and then kind of close the door. Oh yeah, it seems like the store's really open. It's not an accident. People who are afraid, even when God gives them opportunities or when God sends them a message. And I'll be honest with you, that's me. I am an individual who is pretty risk averse. I would like a 100% chance of success before I make an attempt. I'm the kind of person where if God sent me a message the first reaction would probably be fear. And if that's you, maybe you can relate to what happens next with Zechariah. It says this, when Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and overcome with fear, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah, because your prayer has been heard. Pause. At this point, we have no prayer of Zechariah. In fact, what we're gonna see is the prayer that has been heard was apparently a prayer to have a child, a prayer that Zechariah likely, remember, he's an old man, he didn't wake up that morning saying, God, will you give me and Elizabeth a child? This was a prayer that maybe he had prayed many times earlier in his life. But it was almost as if God said, I hear your prayers, I'm gonna kind of bind them up and at exactly the right moment, then I'm going to bless you with this answered prayer. But who knows, was Zechariah confused? Like, what do you mean my prayer? Like, what, what are you talking about? Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will name him John. There will be joy and delight for you and many will rejoice at his birth. Imagine the confusion. Imagine what Zechariah is thinking. What do you mean a son? What do you mean, John? What do you mean rejoicing at his birth? Four in verse 15, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will never drink beer or wine. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's room. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the understanding of the righteous to make ready for the Lord a prepared people. And we come back now to that principle of preparation. That God did not merely want to send his son. He, he didn't simply drop Jesus in Bethlehem and say, here we go, get ready. No, he, before Jesus ever came, said, my plan that I have been preparing literally from the beginning needs to be prepared. There needs to be a messenger who goes before so that all the people know you need to repent and turn to God. You need to get ready and prepare yourself because God is doing a new thing and he wants you to be a participant in his kingdom work. God says that he desires a prepared people. And here's what I would pose to you. This was true not only of Israel in John's day that John would go prepare the way for Jesus in that moment. This is true of us as well. 
That if God is going to do a new and fresh work in your life, if God is going to do a new and fresh work in your marriage, if God is going to do a new and fresh work in this church, we have got to be prepared and ready for what he has for us. Which leads us to some principles. I think there are some principles that we can draw out of this text. As we think about the kind of person that John the Baptist was and the way that God prepared for Jesus, the first principle I want you to see is this, is a prepared people are a purified people. A prepared people are a purified people. Go back with me, if you will, to verse 15. There's this interesting nugget. We went by it really fast, but it says this. It talks about John the Baptist. He will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will never drink wine or beer. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. Now, uh, if you're looking at that thinking, well, where did wine or beer come from? I mean, after all, he is John the Baptist. Like, this is why we call him John the Baptist, because of this verse, right? Right? No, that's a joke. That's not why we call him John the Baptist. Jesus called him John the Baptist. He literally did baptize people. But when it comes to this moment, this angel comes to him and says, all right, Zechariah, your child is going to be set apart from birth. And he's talking about something very specific. He's talking about something called a Nazarite vow or a a Nazarite commitment. And this is something, there were some famous Nazarites in scripture. One of them was Samuel. Another of them was Samson. Samson's probably the most famous. And what do you know about Samson? He never, what, cut his hair. Why? Because of the Nazarite vow. Parents could dedicate their children to the Lord and under the Nazarite vow, or adults could choose to enter into the Nazarite vow. Why? As a sign of their commitment to God. And here were the terms. One, you never cut your hair. Another one was you would never drink beer or any fermented beverage, and especially you wouldn't drink any wine. In fact, some of the Nazarites said, in order to keep our vow, we're not even going to walk through vineyards to touch grapes. Why? Because we want everyone to know that we are committed to the Lord. The other day I was driving down Jefferson and we were passing Arby's and I noticed something, there was a a van full of people who were getting out at Arby's and the reason I noticed is because the the men who were getting out were Mennonite. And uh, I I could tell they were Mennonite, one, because they had a van instead of a horse and buggy, so I knew they weren't Amish and I also could tell they were Mennonite because they looked like they were Mennonite, right? I mean, you know exactly what I mean. They were dressed, they had beards, I could never be a Mennonite, they'd kick me out after two weeks because I couldn't make, make the beard standard. But they got out and, and as I looked at him, I just, I thought, you got to respect these guys. I mean, think about this. Most Christians seek to blend in. Most Christians, if you look at them, there's nothing externally that would mark them out. And listen, Christianity isn't about externals, it's about the heart. We know that. But you've got to respect people who are willing to say openly and publicly to the world, we are so committed to follow Christ in our understanding of that narrow way, we are so committed that we are literally willing to look different from everyone else. We don't care about style, we don't care about appearance, it's not about those things. We want to follow Christ. This is something like what it would have meant for John to be a Nazarite. People would have seen him his whole life. Instantly, you would have noticed from his hair that he was different, that he had been committed to God. He was a purified man, someone who not only followed the way of the law, but went even beyond and said, I'm not going to even have wine or beer or grapes or anything like that. He was a man who was literally consecrated or purified from birth. And listen, because of that purity, he was a useful instrument in the hands of God. And this is, this, is, this is kind of a tense point. When, when we think about the Christian walk, we are called to be people of grace. We are called to, called to be the most gracious of all people. Why? Because we of all people have received grace of God. We know what it's like to be sinners in desperate need of a savior. But there's another side of that coin and the other side is this. We are called to be a holy people. Even as we are called to be gracious and compassionate, we are called to live holy lives. Why? Because God tells us over and over and over again, he will not bless and he will not use disobedience. You will find no example in scripture of God using a disobedient servant to fulfill his purposes. Or if he does use them, it's not because of them, it's in spite of them. We have got to recapture the idea of holiness in the church. 
Not so that we can go out and think, oh, well, I'm gonna stand out. I'm gonna be better than everyone else. No, we have got to recapture the idea of holiness because holiness equates to usefulness. Holiness means I am a prepared vessel. God, I want to search my life, not because I'm better than, not because I I want people to see me, but God, I want there to be no sin. I want there to be no hindrance in my relationship with you so that when you look at your servants, you can choose me. You can can know that I'm, I'm useful in your hands. Paul says it like this. There are some vessels that are there for common use. There are some there that are prepared for special use. God, make us a people who are prepared for special use because we care about purity. John was prepared from birth as a purified man. And I I just want to ask you, and I want to ask myself, are you living a pure life right now? And listen to me, listen to me. Ultimately, our purity comes from the blood of Christ. We have no righteousness of our own. But those who love Christ will keep his commands. Are, Are you living a pure life? Is there a sin in your life that you know, you know because of the Holy Spirit living in you that God is not pleased? And it's kind of like this. Have, have you ever been in a fight in your marriage? You ever been in that moment where the person that you love most, it's miserable to be in their presence? Yes. It's not that your relationship is broken, but because of whatever it is that, that's the rift between you, you don't get to enjoy that relationship like you should. Well, sometimes that's the way it is with sin. When there's sin in our life, we don't get to enjoy our relationship with God. Sometimes in our lives when there's sin present, it makes us miserable. Why? Because we don't get to experience that relationship. God desires a pure people. And here's the amazing thing. He offers the only means by which we can experience that purity. But we've got to repent. Second principle is this, a prepared people are an empowered people. Go back to that same verse. Not only was he going to be a Nazarite, not only was he going to be purified and set apart, he was someone who would be filled, it says, with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. This is absolutely incredible. And as we think about the power of the Holy Spirit, this is going to be a consistent theme through the book of Luke. When the Spirit falls upon someone or the Spirit moves, incredible things happen. All of a sudden, that which at first seems impossible becomes ordinary when the spirit is moving and here's the amazing thing we might look at John the Baptist Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest among all men but the Bible says in the book of Acts which is just basically Luke part two the Bible says that for every believer we have been empowered by the same Holy Spirit the same Holy Spirit that indwelt John in the womb is amongst us right here right now The same healing power of the Spirit, the the same comforting power of the Spirit, the same convicting power of the Spirit is among us and within us when we call upon the name of the Lord. So a prepared people are those who walk with the Spirit. A prepared people are those who listen to the Spirit and allow the Spirit to lead and guide us in every decision of our lives. This is what it meant for John to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is amazing because filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean, think about this. We're gonna get to this a little bit later, but just as a kind of preview, When Elizabeth is carrying John in her womb, Mary is later gonna come and Jesus is gonna be in her presence. This is kind of what happens. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, here's what it said, that John in the womb leapt with joy because he was in the presence of Jesus. That's one of the greatest evidences of the Holy Spirit in your life. Whenever Jesus is there, whenever Jesus is glorified, your heart begins to surge with a holy fire of joy and expectation and desire, and you begin to leap. The Holy Spirit within you begins to just move whenever Jesus is present. And it's also, by the way, an amazing thing that a, a second trimester John in the womb leapt when a first trimester Jesus entered into his presence. There's some implications there that maybe we'll get to another time. But the Holy Spirit empowered John and the Holy Spirit empowers us. And listen, if we wanna be prepared, we've gotta know we're not gonna bust through that door in our own strength. We're not gonna take the next mountain because we're so good or we're so strong. The only way that the fruit of our lives will last if it's the fruit that is produced by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, this is, where the, this is where the interaction between Zechariah and Gabriel gets really weird because remember, Zechariah has been told, 
Set him apart. He's gonna be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's gonna do these amazing things. There are a whole lot of Old Testament prophecies where it says he'll bring, uh, come in the spirit of Elijah, turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, make the disobedient understanding. And he's basically saying, John is gonna prepare the way. But now, look at Zechariah's response, okay? Now we get back to the human element. Gabriel's done, verse 18. How can I know this? Zechariah asked the angel. For I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. This is a moment where I wish we got some kind of insight into the mind of Gabriel. And we get to his response in a second. But if you're Gabriel, it's almost like, Zechariah, you're a priest, right? Like you followed the law. You've heard the story. Do you not remember the story of Abraham and Sarah? Do you not remember how Abram's like 100 years old, Sarah's like 90 and very similar. I'm going to bless you. Like, do you not think that God can do this? I mean, after all, I'm an angel. At which point, look at what Gabriel says. I am convinced. I am so convinced that this is meant to be comical. And here's why. Look at what the angel says. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel. Gabriel, by the way, just means mighty one of God. Gabriel saying, I am the mighty one of God who stands in the presence of God and I was spent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. In other words, Zechariah, I'm not here to prove it to you. Like, how much more proof do you need than an angel appearing to you with a word from God himself? And it's almost like, it's almost like Gabriel saying, listen, Zechariah, you may be new to this. I literally stand in the presence of God all day long, every day. Like I'm part of the chorus that says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Whenever God tells angels something, we don't ask how he's going to do it, right? Whenever I see the holy presence of God, I don't think to myself, God, can you really accomplish what you say you can accomplish? Now listen, apparently Gabriel was an angel with short patience. So if you ever meet an angel, just take their word. It says this in the next verse. Now listen, You will become silent and unable to speak until the day these things take place. Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. In other words, Zechariah, mistake, buddy. (laughs) You didn't believe. I told you. And on the one hand, let's give Zechariah a break. I mean, after all, he is old. After all, his wife is beyond childbearing years. But here again, the hesitation of faith comes into play. And this is me. This is where I relate to Zachariah. Even if an angel came to me to tell me something, I think I would be like, "Mm." a little bit like Moses, like, God, are you sure there's not someone else? Or or this is what some of us do. We believe in the power of God. After all, Zachariah knew about the story of Abraham and Sarah, didn't he? He knew about all of the miracles of the Old Testament. He was a righteous and devoted man. He was a faithful man. But in the moment, whenever all of the promises of God come barreling into his life, it's really easy for him to say, God, I know you can do it in other people. I know you have done it in other people. In theory, I know you can do it in my life, but can you please just prove it to me? That's how most of us operate. No, it's how I do. Where it's like, God, I've seen what you've done in other people's lives, but I'm not sure you can do it on my own. Or I know what you can do with someone else's marriage, but God, I'm not sure what you can do in my own. Or I know someone else who's been far away from God and, and, and then they've come to faith, but God, I'm not sure you can do it with my friend. This is how many of us operate. We know about the miracles of God. We can tell the stories of God from day to night. But do we believe when the time comes that God is faithful to us in our lives? Now, here's the comforting part, and it's the next principle. A prepared people are an imperfect people. Notice what Gabriel didn't do. He didn't say, well, Zechariah, that was a one-shot deal. You didn't believe me? I'm taking it back. No. He did shut up Zechariah for a while. Who knows? Maybe that was just a Christmas present to Elizabeth. We don't know. But it reminds us that Zechariah, even though he was imperfect, God still used him. And that should be an encouragement to all of us. Even if we have a hesitation of faith, like, God, yes, but no, but yes, but maybe, can you really do it? Listen, God says, I'll still use you. There may be some consequences, but God uses imperfect people. After all, that's the only people he has to work with. So when we think about our life, have you ever felt inadequate for something? Have you ever felt like you're not up to the challenge? Have you ever felt like other people may look at you with, with respect or something, but you just wonder, is that, 
It's not how I feel about myself. Or has God ever opened a door and you said, God, I'm just not sure I want to go through? Here's the good news. As long as you have breath in your lungs, God is not done with you. God has more doors for you to go through. And even when you stumble, God's faithfulness will pick you back up and he will take you across the finish line himself. God used an imperfect man who was a good man. He was a righteous man. He had faith, but he hesitated. God said, Zechariah, I'm still going to use you. Kind of like what he did with Abraham. God's faithfulness, not our own. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, look at how the story progresses. Verse 21. The people were waiting for Zechariah, amazed that he had stayed so long in the sanctuary. From their perspective, they're looking at this, right? And they're like, what's going on? Like, usually it takes about 30 seconds. You light the incense, you come back out. They're kind of like, what is happening in there, okay? At this point, though, the story continues, verse 22. When he did come out, he could not speak to them. Then they realized he had seen a vision in the sanctuary. He was making signs to them and remained speechless. Now, this is the part that I think is absolutely hilarious because just, just let your imagination go wild for a second, okay? Zechariah comes out, and he can't speak. You know, the, the question is, like, what signs did he make? Like, <laughs> you know, like, seriously, what did he do? This was like the ultimate game of charades where, you know, Zechariah is like, mm, who knows, who knows? But it's hilarious, and he was making signs to them. Eventually, he probably understood, man, I shouldn't have questioned Gabriel. And then what does it say in the next verse? When the days of his ministry were completed, he went back home. God gave him a promise. He went back home, went through the whole thing again with Elizabeth. I would love to have seen that. Didn't say a word, but apparently... She got the point, verse 24, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and kept herself in seclusion for five months. Now, think about this for a moment. Notice, Elizabeth never received the vision. Elizabeth never received the promise. Elizabeth is a perfect example of someone that everyone else would have overlooked. Everyone else would have forgotten. Everyone else would have said, I mean, just think in the, in the dustbin of history, how many lives go unnoticed there's no reason that Elizabeth should have ever garnered anyone's attention. But God saw her. God remembered her. And look at her response in verse 25. She said, the Lord has done this for me. He has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. Isn't it amazing how the birth of John the Baptist is kind of the 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 fire that lit the fuse of the gospel message. But isn't it amazing how this moment that was so necessary in the scope of all of redemptive history, 2,000 years of preparation, that when it happened to Elizabeth, notice what she said, the Lord has done this for me. Like it's not just that God has taken care of the salvation of all mankind, of course he was, but she received that as a blessing that, listen, reminded her that God did see her, that God did care about her, that God truly did care about her disgrace and her tears and her fears. And in that moment, this is, this is what's so amazing about God. God has the ability both to orchestrate all of history as well as to remember every single cry from the heart of one of his children. He is that big and he is that good. And notice what she says, he has looked with favor in these days to take away my disgrace among the people. I mean, imagine that you're talking to 20-year-old Elizabeth who is desperate because she wants to have a child. She wants to be a mother, but it doesn't happen. 25-year-old Elizabeth, 30-year-old Elizabeth, 35-year-old Elizabeth. Remember, in a culture where people would have said, well, there must be something wrong with her. Maybe there's some sin that we don't know about. And over and over, as time goes on, time goes on, who knows how many prayers she prayed? Who knows how many tears she cried? But imagine if you talk to 20-year-old Elizabeth and said, you know, Elizabeth, God knows exactly what you want. 
And in his timing, he's going to give you something that's better than you can imagine. If you would have told her that when you're an old woman, God is going to come and he's going to use you to be the, the womb bearer of one of the greatest men of all of history, the precursor to the very Lord of heaven himself, if you would have explained that to 20-year-old Elizabeth, she would not and could not have understood And this is what we have to remind ourselves of. When it comes to our faith, listen, sometimes we cannot possibly understand what God is doing. We cannot understand how he's bottling up all those tears. We cannot understand how he's holding on to all of those prayers. We cannot understand the end from the beginning. Why? Because we are mortal. We are people. We are sinners. We are finite. God, meanwhile, is looking at all of us and just saying, listen, you may not understand, but please trust me. Please trust me through the tragedy. Please trust me through the feelings of forgottenness. Please trust me through the feelings of shame. Because he was orchestrating something greater than she could have ever conceived. But listen, her response when it finally came, became clear, when it finally came into focus was to say, God, thank you. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for taking away my disgrace. Thank you for your faithfulness to me. Which leads us to the last point that a prepared people are a grateful people. And that's not to say that we're grateful for everything in our lives. Some things are horrible. Some things are awful. Some things are traumatic and will stay with you for the rest of your life. But rest assured, God is faithful. And in his divine plan, in his divine providence, he is able to take even our deepest wounds and our worst scars, and he's able to use them and turn them for something good in our lives. That doesn't mean we would ever want to go through it again. It doesn't mean that we would ever wish it on anyone else. It doesn't mean that we have to celebrate whenever we're sinned against or the pain is coming, but God is calling us to have faith. And then when that faith comes to fruition, our response has got to be a response of gratitude that says, Lord, you have shown your favor, your undeserved grace, same word, to me. And a prepared people must be a grateful people, a people who are willing to step back and say, God, Based on all that you've done in the past, I know that I can trust you in the future. Even when I don't understand, God, I can trust that this plan is in your hands. And to be grateful whenever God shows up and does something beyond anything you could have possibly understood. Sometimes I think we're a church with too short a memory to come back and praise God for all he's done. But for Elizabeth, she said, this favor, I'm going to turn back to praise. And listen, we're, we're coming into a week of Thanksgiving, right? We're just, as a culture, we, we just pause. But listen, as Christians, it's gotta be so much more than that because here's the amazing thing. Not only was Elizabeth grateful for her son, but imagine you tell 20-year-old Elizabeth, hey, I'm gonna have you wait, not just for your son, but your son is gonna talk about my son. You see, Elizabeth's gratitude wasn't just simply because now she's a mom. It's that now she's the mom of the man who's proclaiming the Savior. That God would send his son for the sins of Elizabeth. That all of the sudden, this, this, this moment of, of silence where no prophetic message had been heard, her son would break that silence to point to the everlasting Savior who came from heaven to earth on a mission to die for sinners, to purchase us for redemption. This was something that was beyond her wildest dreams. But to understand that, to get to that point, to truly appreciate it, she had to show gratitude on the way that God, I don't understand all of what you're doing, but I'm grateful for what you've shown me and I'm gonna keep taking a step of faith. I'm gonna keep taking a step of faith. And listen, in so many of our lives, that's where we're at. And I believe that as a church. Listen, God has done some great things in the church. Ministries are growing, people are coming, the church is doing well, but I am convinced that there is more There is more like John the Baptist and Jesus. Jesus is so much more. John said, I'm not even worthy of untying his sandals. I believe God has so much more for us, but we've got to stop and be grateful for what he's done and say, God, please don't stop. Don't stop pouring out your spirit. Don't stop moving among us. Don't stop healing us. Don't stop convicting us. Don't stop because we're not going to be satisfied with anything less than you. I had a good friend this week, and here's what he said. He said, you know what? I don't think we're going to get to heaven, and God's going to look at us and be like, you know, you guys were crazy. 
You guys, you guys took chances. You guys, you, you, you know, you went way beyond me. No, I don't think we're going to get to heaven and God's going to be like, man, you guys were too risky. But I think it's very possible if we're not willing to take a step of faith that God's going to look and say, why didn't you trust me? But listen, gratitude is a seed that grows into faith. And so I just want to end today by asking you, what has God done that you're grateful for? Or maybe you're not as grateful as you should be. That's where I'm at a lot. But what has God done? How has God proven himself to you in the past that will then produce the faith that you need for whatever door that he wants you to be prepared to walk through? A purified people, an empowered people, an imperfect people, but listen, a grateful people.